addressing it at a conscious level would be like saying, hey, I'm only going to eat X number of calories today. Addressing at a non-conscious level would be, would be saying, hey, I'm not going to give the brain these cues that are put that are causing it to push me to eat more food and causing it to push me to not feel as full at this meal. That's Dr. Stephen Guillenay on Psychologist Off the Clock. Curious what psychologists chat about over coffee? We are three clinical psychologists who love to discuss the best ideas from psychology. I'm Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado. And from coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoengren, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. In this podcast, we explore the psychological principles that we use in our clinical work. And we bring you ideas from psychology that can help you flourish in your work, parenting, relationships, and health. Thank you for listening to Psychologist Off the Clock. Today's episode is all about eating and how much of our eating behavior is under unconscious control by our brains. Dr. Stephen Guillen is going to explain why our brains are a mismatch for the modern day food environment and what we can do about it. This episode is timely. It's right smack during the holidays when we're all going to be enjoying food and family. And it's also a time of year where many of us struggle with overeating. And if you're medically overweight, it's a time of year where gaining weight may exacerbate your struggle. Dr. Stephen Guillen is going to help us with some strategies to address our hungry brains. And I'm wondering, Debbie, for you, how do you approach and integrate healthy eating into your family? Well, first of all, the struggle is real, Diana. I feel like it's hard. I mean, it's hard when the convenience foods are so much easier and it does take that extra bit of effort to get the whole foods, the fresh foods and prepare them yourself is is something that is definitely a challenge. A couple of things that I do that come to mind, one is just making large batches if I have a couple of hours when I can make a big pot of soup or something else that, that has a lot of veggies in it and whole foods, I just make a big batch. And that way I have the leftovers and I can even tweak them a little bit over the days, you know, following. So that helps. I think for me, another thing is just to look out for options of convenient foods that, that are a little bit, you know, healthier to eat. So things like we, Diana, we both have a shared love of those pre-cooked lentils you can buy at Trader Joe's. So on the days when cooking lentils is even too much effort, you can just take those, throw in a little extra fresh veggie and a little, you know, olive oil or something like that and have something that you could eat for lunch that's, that doesn't feel like, oh, I really, you know, ate something that's pretty terrible for me. What about you, Diana? What kinds of strategies do you use? Well, I really like the idea of setting yourself up so that you can succeed when you're in a situation that would be sort of tempting. So for example, whenever I'm hosting a party or I'm going to a party, I like to have whole food options available for folks so that you can load up your plate with some veggies and fruit in addition to the treats that are going to be available. We had people over last night and I had a big display of chocolate, but then I asked people asked people to bring fruit as an option. And so then you can have a little bit of each. And I think that thinking ahead is one of our best things that we can do to prepare so that when you're in the moment, it's not sort of the uh, emotional mind that's making the decision, but rather it's been your frontal lobe ahead of time. So Dr. Guillenay will talk a little bit more about that in our episode, how to use our brains in a more skillful way in our approach to food. So pull up some Brussels sprouts and maybe a little sliver of pumpkin pie and take a listen. Stefan Guillenay is a researcher, science consultant, and science communicator. He earned a BS in biochemistry at the University of Virginia and a PhD in neuroscience at the University of Washington, where he continued as a postdoctoral fellow studying the brain mechanisms that regulate body fatness and eating behavior. His scientific publications have been cited more than 2,000 times by his peers. His book, The Hungry Brain, was named one of the best books of the year by Publishers Weekly and called Essential by the New York Times Book Review. He is currently a senior fellow at GiveWell and scientific reviewer for the examine.com research digest. 
He also grows much of his own food and brews a mean hard cider. Welcome, Dr. Guillaume. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, it's great to have you. I actually first encountered your book through a client of mine that I've been working with for about five years now. He's lost over 120 pounds, and he has done all the research that he could possibly do on, on how to lose weight. And I, he passed me this book saying this is what has been probably the most helpful piece of literature for him on understanding why it's so hard to lose weight and keep it off. So it's a real pleasure to actually talk to you in person. And I'm excited to explore some of the concepts in your book around the hungry brain today. Yeah, thank you. That's really great. That's the kind of feedback that uh, is, is very encouraging for me to hear. Well, you study the brain and the role that it plays in eating. And one of the ideas that you really challenge is our common belief that we just need to find the right diet to follow. And then if we follow it, we'll be able to become healthy. And what you argue is that this model is faulty because much of the processes related to overeating and overweight are actually not conscious. Can we just sort of start by describing why is this the case? What is the reward system in the brain and, and how does it relate to our problems with overeating? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, just to illustrate the concept of conscious versus non-conscious regulation of eating behavior, um, I think it's it's instructive to consider that most people would rather not be overweight. Most people would rather not have obesity. Yet here we are, you know, two thirds of Americans either are overweight or have obesity. We're spending billions of dollars on weight loss programs. So why is it that we are, you know, obviously this is related to our diet and lifestyle in large part. So why are we engaging in these behaviors that we don't really want to engage in behaviors that, uh, you know, reduce our chances of having, you know, the health that we want to have over the long term. And the reason is that we are in constant tension between these, uh, constructive, rational, conscious, long-term goals for our bodies and the um, intentions of non-conscious brain circuits that drive us towards certain types of food and certain quantities of food. So um, essentially the fact that we would rather not overeat, we would rather not eat unhealthy food, yet we do it anyway, I think that is a really simple, clear illustration of this tension between conscious and non-conscious circuits in the brain that both have an interest in different eating behaviors. And so we can get into what some of those circuits are later. But, you know, um, I want to give you kind of a hypothetical situation because one of the things I talk about in my book, in the introduction in particular, is, um, you know, the fact that we have these dietary guidelines, uh, yet they have not had much impact on the uh, level of body fatness in this country. So like, uh, despite the publication of these USDA dietary guidelines, we've had, you know, if anything, an acceleration of the obesity epidemic, not a reduction. And, you know, I want to, to illustrate this, I want to, I want to lay out this hypothetical scenario. Um, you know, imagine that tomorrow I did some experiment that was able to figure out what the exact optimal eating pattern is for human beings. And I had a big press conference and I told the entire United States and the entire world exactly what the best way to eat is for health and body fatness and everything. Do you think that no one would ever eat pizza again or no one would ever eat brownies again or no one would ever eat soda again after they understood what the optimal eating pattern is. And, and no, yeah, absolutely not. Absolutely not, right? I mean, we're not making our decisions based on the health impacts of the, the things that we eat. I mean, sure, that is a factor that plays into it, but the information alone of knowing what a healthy diet is is not sufficient to change our behavior enough to stem the rising tide of uh, excess body fatness and um, health complications related to it because we we're making our decisions based on a lot of other factors, not just health, 
And those factors, many of them are based on non-conscious brain regions that are just doing their function that evolved to keep our ancestors alive. But today, those same functions are maladaptive in, the, in modern society. Yeah. I mean, I, I see that with my kids. If I make them a healthy meal, like a enchiladas that packed with vegetables and all sorts of things, I'll get back their plate and all of the like the healthy parts, like the zucchini and the carrots will have been picked out and not eaten. <laughs> and so there's got to be something innate there that sort of guides our choices around eating the, the sort of unhealthy foods. Why is it that what, what, what is the role that our brain is playing in, in our choosing the foods that aren't as good for us? Like, why is that the case? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. We have intrinsic motivations that drive us towards foods with certain food properties and away from foods with different food properties. So, you know, most people would say that vegetables are a healthy food, right? I mean, we should be eating more vegetables for the vitamins and minerals and fiber and polyphenols and all the all the good stuff. We should be eating more fruit. Um, but kids don't really like vegetables that much. I mean, vegetables, they're full of vitamins and minerals. They're full of things that are good for us in the modern world. So why would kids be instinctively kind of not very excited about vegetables, but really excited about these other things that we know aren't so good for you? Why are kids so excited about pizza and cake? Why are kids so excited about donuts, refined carbohydrates, sugar and added fats, deep fried foods? Why are those the things that kids love and then they don't want to touch their vegetables? Well, the reason is that humans are hardwired with certain preferences for uh, certain food properties. And these are the um, motivations that sustained our ancestors in, uh, in times past. So essentially, the brain is hardwired to seek foods that are concentrated in carbohydrate, fat, protein, salt, and glutamate, which is that uh, meaty umami flavor that's in soy sauce and MSG and bone broth and cooked meat. So our brains are hardwired to detect those foods via receptors in our mouths, but primarily via receptors in our upper small intestine. And so when you eat a food, your digestive tract, your mouth, your stomach, your small intestine collects all this data on what you just ate, collects data on the volume of it and the nutrient composition of it and the concentration of those different nutrients. And all of that information goes up your vagus nerve. Well, the stuff in your mouth doesn't go up your vagus nerve, but most of the important stuff from your stomach and your small intestine goes up your vagus nerve into your brainstem and then gets disseminated to the rest of your brain. And one of the things that information does is it determines how much dopamine gets released by your striatum or sorry, into your striatum. And so and not just striatum, also other associated brain regions. But basically what that does is uh, does a couple of things. First of all, it motivates you to continue eating whatever you're doing. So the higher the concentration of sugar and starch and fat in your food, the more motivated you're going to be to keep eating it in the moment. So maybe you won't stop at one slice of pizza. You'll want to eat three or four. And the second thing, even more importantly, is that it causes you to learn. So it causes you the next time you encounter the sensory cues that are associated with that food, so the appearance of it, the smell of it, the taste of it, the location where you, where you ate it last time, the people you were with, the situation, all of those things become cues once they are associated, once they're stamped in by that dopamine, those become cues that motivate you. They turn into motivational triggers in the future. It's just like Pavlov's dog. When he rang the bell every time he fed the dogs, eventually those dogs learned to salivate and to have this anticipatory motivational and digestive response to food just from hearing that bell, that initially meaningless sensory stimulus. So same with us, the smell of food, the sight of food, those things become associated with the foods that we eat, just like the sound of the bell. 
And so when we see brownies on the counter or we smell them coming out of the oven or we're, you know, in the break room and we know there's always cookies in there or always, you know, whatever it is, then that is a motivational trigger that triggers us to desire those foods. We get this motivational response. And again, a craving, this is a craving I'm talking about. This is not something that you choose to experience. This is something that wells up from non-conscious parts of your brain when they are stimulated by dopamine reinforced sensory cues from the last time you ate that food. So what you're describing is dopamine is a neurohormone that isn't necessarily what causes the pleasure in food, but rather it's the one that helps us with our learning and also increases craving for food. It's just like, you know, smoking crack. It's the same thing. You smoke crack, you get a bunch of dopamine, and that makes you more likely to engage in crack smoking behaviors in the future. If you eat brownies and pizza, you get a bunch of dopamine and that makes you more likely to engage in brownie and pizza eating behavior in the future. This is how reinforcement works. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say pizza is the same as crack cocaine. I'm just trying to say that the process is analogous. Right. And in your book, you do talk about how our food is being engineered in to increase its dopamine release in our brain, much like how crack cocaine originally came from a cocoa leaf. And there was a, a whole slew of processes that it underwent for it to, to turn into crack and have the massive impact on our brains that crack does. And it was interesting because I recently went on a trip to Peru and one of the things that they gave us when we first arrived was coca leaves. And we were told to chew on them and drink the tea throughout the trip to help manage altitude sickness. And I didn't get high off of those uh, coca leaves in the same way that if you were to eat a beet and have the natural sugars that are in a beet, it's very different from the highly processed um, beet sugar that gets turned into white sugar that we end up cooking with. Um, and, you know, same thing with, you know, whole grain that turns into the flour that then we make into, you know, pizza. So there is, you know, some similarity between, I think, drugs of abuse and uh, some of the, the foods that get highly processed that we eat. Um, of course, crack cocaine releases a lot more dopamine than pizza. And so that's why it can have more severe effects on your life. But I mean, I don't want to minimize the effects that food can have on people's lives either. I mean, most people literally are driving themselves to health destruction due in large part to dopamine mediated reinforcement, this exact process I'm talking about. And, and by the way, I, I want to be clear, I'm not saying this is the only factor that shapes our eating behavior. And this is definitely not the only non-conscious system that shapes our eating behavior. But this is just one example of one thing where evolution has crafted this amazing system to help our ancestors eat the right things to keep them alive and fertile. But once it's taken out of its appropriate evolutionary context, it can really cause us a lot of trouble. You draw a lot from some of your experiences of studying uh, hunter-gatherer and uh, exploring anthropology to understand why it is that we have some of these preferences. Can you talk a little bit about that and the evolution science behind why we prefer fat and sugar and salt? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's the, the basic concept is, is really quite simple. We require energy to survive. We require energy to reproduce and reproduction is the currency of natural selection. And so over the course of evolutionary history, our brains have been selected to generate efficient energy-seeking behaviors, energy as in calories. So we have this incredible piece of hardware that you know gets filled in with some great software too in our skulls that helps us seek the food properties that, you know, would have made our ancestors successful. And 
energy is really the number one thing you need from a food perspective, but you also need uh, protein and you need a bunch of other things. But a lot of those things kind of, you know, if you eat enough calories, you're going to get enough vitamins if your diet is a diverse omnivorous diet made of unrefined foods like a hunter gatherer's diet would be. So you don't need to have a motivational system for thiamine. You don't need to have a motivational system for potassium. You just need to have one that gets you enough calories. And the thing that supplies those calories is carbohydrate, fat, and protein. As far as I know, the only um, non-calorie containing substance that we have an innate motivation for is salt. So that's, as far as I know, that's the one micronutrient that we can actually taste, that we can actually have a direct motivational response to. Um, so that's the one exception. But besides that, everything we respond to in terms of our hard, hard wiring um, that's either been directly demonstrated or strongly suspected is linked to calorie delivery. So our brains were designed to be very focused on calories because they were of utmost importance to the survival and reproduction of our ancestors. If our brains were wired to care about vitamins and minerals, we would be so crazy about kale. We would just be stuffing it down. We'd be eating kale and liver nonstop. That would be our fa favorite foods. But uh, most people don't really like those foods that much, especially plain. You know, nobody just kind of cooks kale without fat and salt in it. It's always got something in it to soup it up. Um, so, yeah, so essentially you have these motivational systems that involved in that context. And those are the motivational systems that we inherited from our ancestors. And, you know, the brain is just kind of a hodgepodge of systems that do what they need to do to keep us alive. It doesn't all make perfect sense. Like, in an ideal world, we would understand, you know, we would have conscious of control over our cravings, conscious awareness of where they come from. Um, and we could kind of say, well, you know what, at this point, I don't think I should like pizza anymore. I'm just going to shut off my pizza cravings. But that's not how the brain works. The brain evolved a system that worked well enough in the context that it evolved in. And that's what we inherited. So it's kind of, you know, a clumsy thing in the current context, but we don't really have any choice in, in that. That's just how it is. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And if you look at the diets of hunter gatherers, I think it's really important to look at the context that our brain is more accustomed to, um, and say, you know, how does that differ from the context today? If you look at hunter-gatherer diets, they're very different from the diets that we eat today. First of all, they had to really work for their food. So if you're feeling hungry, you know, how, let me, let me give you a little thought experiment. Like, how hungry would you have to be for a, you know, a piece of pizza or whatever, whatever food you really like? How hungry would you have to be to run three miles and climb a tree in order to eat that food. You'd probably have to be pretty hungry, right? I mean, you're not going to do that for nothing. You're not going to do that if you're just like a little bit bored or maybe it's meal time. Like you, you'd have to be pretty hungry to do that. And that's the situation that hunter gatherers are in. They have to work hard for their food. And so for them to get to the motivational level where they're actually going to seek it out, they have to, that has to be a higher level of motivation than we have. What's interesting is that our modern day food environment is the exact opposite. So we're doing everything in our power to really outsource, it seems, our movement. And, you know, back in the day when my grandmother wanted whipped cream, she would get a bowl and a whisk and whip up her cream, which is kind of like a workout. And now we can just get a can of it, right, and spray it. Uh, we can get a box that shows up at our door that has everything pre-cut. So we don't even have to cut our vegetables anymore. We can just open up the packages and pour them into a pan. We can drive up to a window and get the food delivered directly to our hand without having to get out of our car. And one of the things that we've been doing in our, in our household in response to this is just trying to 
figure out ways to go back to more traditional ways of living around food and everything from, you know, putting nuts on a table so that we crack our own nuts to when my, just the other day, my son was really hungry and we live on this lane where we have a lot of fruits and we have a garden and I send him out there because go forage kid (laughs) kitchens close. So he walks down the lane to go pick some fruits and vegetables. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, basically the modern food environment has dramatically changed the cost benefit equation of eating. So the costs of food have declined dramatically in terms of the effort required to eat it. Also in terms of the monetary costs, food is far cheaper than at any time in human history, at least here in the U.S. and in Western Europe and other affluent countries. Um, So the costs have declined dramatically, while the benefits in terms of the concentration of carbohydrate, fat, protein, and other things that the brain likes have increased. So basically, we have this food that is designed to be incredibly appealing to the non-conscious parts of our brain, and it's incredibly easy for us to get. We have to sacrifice very little time or effort or money to obtain it. So it's really, I mean, when you think about it from that perspective, it's it's really not surprising that we eat more than we used to, and it's very hard for us not to, because we're swimming in this context that's creating a very appealing uh, cost benefit scenario for for eating. Based on your understanding of brain science, how should we be eating? Because I think a lot of us are really confused. On the one hand, we get information from longevity researchers that tell us that we should be eating low animal protein diets. So people like Walter Longo at USC, who say that lower protein diets lead to longer lives. And then the flip side of that. I know that there's some research out there around protein being really helpful for people that are overweight and looking to lose weight because it helps with satiety. What are your thoughts around this? The protein issue is one that I would say is still evolving. So um, I think I think it's pretty clear that protein does increase satiety. Um, and if you eat a high protein diet, it can help you reduce your calorie intake and lose body fat. And that seems like a pretty obviously good thing if you carry excess body fat. Um, But on the other hand, you have this aging research suggesting that higher protein diets can uh, are not optimal for lifespan, and that low protein diets actually are better. And I don't know. I mean, I, I don't I don't know exactly where to come down on that, because if you're a person who has uh, excess body fatness that is holding you back from your goals for yourself, including your health goals, then, you know, is it are you really going to harm yourself by eating a high protein diet and losing fat? I'm kind of skeptical of that, you know, but if you're someone who's already lean and healthy, should you eat a high protein diet or a low protein diet, it's possible that you would be better served by a low protein diet over the, over the long run. Um, but you know, that too is pretty uncertain because most of the evidence we have on low protein diets is from animal models. We don't have data in humans directly demonstrating that eating a lower protein diet extends life. So I think right now it's a lot of speculation about whether the benefits are actually going to materialize in humans. Um, Yeah, because what we have right now is, as far as I know, the the low protein diet thing in terms of directly demonstrating lifespan benefits, I don't think that's gone further than rodent research to my to my knowledge. Um, So, yeah, it's an evolving situation and there's a lot of uncertainty. um, But my view is currently that if a high protein diet can help you control your body fatness, then I think that that's a useful tool. And uh, I don't think you should worry too much about um, the long term consequences for, for the time being. My graduate advisor, Linda Craighead, would always talk about our hunger being like a scream, whereas our 
fullness is more of a whisper. And I'm sure there's some evolutionary reasons behind that as well. What are some strategies that we can use to help our brains register fullness a little bit better in our modern day food environment? Yeah, I think I think there are a lot of things you can do. And my kind of overall perspective is that since the problem is coming from non-conscious or minimally conscious parts of our brain, then we should be addressing those things directly instead of trying to address it at a conscious level. So addressing it at a conscious level would be like saying, hey, I'm only going to eat X number of calories today. Addressing at a non-conscious level would be would be saying, hey, I'm not going to give the brain these cues that are Put, that are causing it to push me to eat more food and causing it to push me to not feel as full at this meal. Um, and I'm not, I'm not against calorie counting. You know, if it works for you, that's great. But I think that we have a lot of studies showing that it generally doesn't work that well for the average person. And so I try to take other approaches. So that's kind of my, my perspective on this. Um, so we talked a little bit about the food environment. I think that is one really important thing. Um, I won't elaborate too much since uh, we already touched on it a little bit, but just, you know, you don't want to have a bunch of visible food in your kitchen. You don't want to have a bunch of visible food in work. You don't want to have, you know, if you, if possible, you don't want to have people bring brownies and donuts and cookies and whatever in to your workplace and putting them in front of you at the conference table. Uh, You want to have a clean food environment that's not pushing you toward eating calorie dense, unhealthy foods that you, that are not consistent with your own goals for yourself. Um, The second thing I would say is that the composition of the food that you eat can have a very large impact on how full you feel. Um, And that the, the amount of fullness that you experience is not that tightly linked to the number of calories that your meal contains. And so that gives us a lever to try to create fullness on fewer calories so that you're achieving your um, your calorie intake goals without having to think about calories and also without having to feel hungry. So that I think that is really, really important because, you know, if you're struggling against these non-conscious systems on a continual basis, like you have hunger all the time and you're having cravings all the time and you have these strong urges emerging from these non-conscious systems, if you're fighting that all the time, you're probably eventually going to lose. Most people eventually lose. So I think a better strategy is to try to address those things. So um, we know that the brain regions that generate satiety, the feeling of fullness, respond to specific food properties. So for example, foods that are lower in calorie density In other words, they contain fewer calories per unit weight or per unit volume. Those foods are more filling per calorie than foods that have a higher calorie density. So just to give you an example, yogurt and cheese have a very similar composition. They're made from the same thing, right? But cheese is a lot more calorie dense than yogurt. And so if you eat the same number of calories of yogurt versus cheese, you're going to feel a lot more full on the yogurt than you are on the cheese. And so, um, and there are many other examples of this, you know, like, uh, bread is a pretty calorie dense starch compared to potatoes and rice. Uh, crackers are more calorie dense than bread. Uh, oatmeal is less calorie dense. Fruit is less calorie dense than sugar. There are then uh, candy, even though they're both mostly sugar. Uh, you know, bacon is more calorie dense than a uh, fresh piece of, you know, a fresh piece of uh, chicken thigh, let's say, even though they're both meat. Um, and so, you know, mostly the calorie density has to do with the water content of a food. So the more water it contains relative to other things, the uh, the more fullness it's going to create per unit calorie up to a point. You can't fool your stomach by just eating lettuce or just eating, you know, watermelon or something. Um, 
So up to a point, you're going to experience more fullness on things that have more water and a lower calorie density. Then also, um, the palatability of a food has a big impact. So how delicious it tastes. The more delicious something tastes, the less full you will feel per unit calorie. And so this is part of the reason why we can eat dessert after a big meal. You know, the cake comes out or the ice cream comes out and all of a sudden you have a second stomach. Part of the reason there is that delicious foods suppress your feeling of satiety. And so things that are plainer, things that are simpler, those will help you feel more full per unit calorie. And it doesn't have to taste bad, but just something simple. Like if you're going to eat if you're going to eat uh, a piece of meat, have a piece of meat. Don't make some fancy sauce on it. If you're going to eat a potato, just eat a plain potato. Don't put butter and sour cream on it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then fiber. So higher fiber creates higher level of um, satiety. Uh, and then finally, protein. So higher protein intake also creates a higher level of satiety. And so now these factors that I've just discussed, if you think about like, if I could take all of those factors and make and, and make the least filling food possible, what would it look like? Well, it would look like all these things that we recognize as junk foods. It would look like French fries. It would look like candy. It would look like brownies. It would look like cake. It would look like, uh, you know, bacon. So this is, um, this is, this is, this, these properties that I'm talking about basically correspond very closely to what we think about as healthy and unhealthy food. If you think about the things that are more filling, you're talking about, uh, you know, oatmeal, you're talking about fruits, you're talking about lean meats and seafood. Um, you're talking about whole grains. So, I mean, I think these properties are one of the main reasons why some foods tend to be fattening and some are more slimming and healthier. But the key thing to understand is that if you eat foods that are lower in calorie density, higher in fiber, higher in protein, and more moderate in palatability, you can eat less while not feeling hungry. It seems that making some of these changes around eating lower palatability foods or adding more fiber, really changing our behaviors around how we eat may be really hard. And I think that's where psychology and in the field of psychology can be really helpful in this process. And there's some researchers, Evan Foreman at Drexel University, Jason Lillis, who we recently had on the show, who wrote The Diet Trap, who talk about some psychological principles that may be very helpful in uh, working on these difficult feelings and thoughts that show up when you're trying to lose weight. So they talk about things like developing distress tolerance, uh, urge surfing when you have food cravings, uh, working on how to address thoughts that come up, like difficult thoughts, like I can't do this. And I was wondering when you make some of these changes around eating less palatable foods, like say you're switching from soda to water, or you put a lot of cream and sugar in your coffee and you start putting less in your coffee. At first it is really hard, but over time, does your brain actually adjust to some of these changes? I'm glad you brought this up because I think this is a substantial challenge um, that we face with this kind of uh, change. But I mean, look at it this way. If you want to eat a healthier diet, you're going to have to give something up. So there's going to be a loss, any method you use to change your diet, whether it's, you know, eating low carb or low fat or lower palatability or whatever it is, there's going to be a loss. And, um, and, and frankly, if you're not willing to to go through with that, if you're not willing to deal with that loss, then I don't see how you're going to be able to improve your diet. So you have to find some way to deal with it. Um, and I think I think we can. Um, and and by the way, I would love to learn more about this topic. You know, I'm not really an expert in this topic. Um, so if there are strategies that other people are developing for this, I would love to learn more about that. 
Yeah, I would look into acceptance-based behavioral treatments for weight loss. And in particular, I really like uh, The Diet Trap by Jason Lillis. And that would be for people that are looking to use these strategies for themselves. And then I also like the book Effective Weight Loss by Evan Foreman that is for clinicians. Yeah. So another thing I, I want to mention is I, I, I really think there's hope, you know, aside from the strategies that um, you mentioned that I would like to learn more about. Um, you know, if you, if we, again, go back to the analogy of addictive drug, um, which again, I'm not saying food is an addictive drug, but there is an analogy there. It's a similar biological process happening in the brain. Um, you know, someone who quits smoking cigarettes, they're going to have a really hard time for a few weeks, like especially in the first days, they're going to have a really hard time. They're not going to be able to go to places where they're experiencing those cues that were previously associated with the nicotine. So the cues that were associated with the dopamine spikes, like, you know, you're not going to hang out with your friends while they're smoking cigarettes. You're not going to go to that bar where people used to smoke. You're not going to go to the convenience store where you used to buy cigarettes. You're not going to keep a lighter and pack of cigarettes on your counter, et cetera, et cetera. You have to get rid of those cues because those cues stimulate the dopamine again, and they get your motivation going, and you're probably going to lose that battle. And so, but what happens is if you look over time, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. That pull and those associations get weaker and weaker and weaker over time. And most people who quit smoking a year or two after they quit, they don't even want to smoke cigarettes anymore. And they can be around people who are smoking, and they might think it smells gross. You know, it's like they they just don't have that motivation anymore. And maybe it's latent. Maybe if they took a puff, it would be reactivated. But as long as they are not re-engaging in the behavior, they can handle the level of motivation that those cues are generating. And so I think it's the same for any dopamine reinforced behavior. It fades over time, just like all of our memories fade. You know, I don't remember the the state capital of every state in the United States that I learned when I was in middle school, um, memories fade over time. And that happens in the reward system as well. And um, so it gets easier over time as long as you're not continually reinforcing those pathways by consuming the foods that are difficult for you. There's another component, though, that I wanted to ask you about, which is that may get easier over time, but there's also metabolic changes that happen when we're losing weight and when we lose weight that are working against us. So in 2016, there was a study that came out with the biggest loser contestants. And I think it was 13 of the 14 contestants in that season eight had regained their weight. Only one of them had maintained her weight loss. And I think it was because she became a fitness instructor or something like that. But you know, sort of what what's happening to our metabolism when we lose weight, and how does it relate to um, sort of this this difficulty of maintaining weight loss? And how are there other strategies that we could use? Like, should we go slower with our weight loss um, to sustain it? Like, maybe give our t- our body a chance to adjust. This is another one of those non conscious systems that uh, affects how we eat, and I think it's really important to understand the system as well if you're going to embark on a weight loss journey because we have a system that regulates body fatness. It's centered in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus and that part of your brain does not want you to lose weight. That's the unfortunate truth. Um, it, you know, it doesn't have any conscious intention. It's just a, a system of non-conscious circuits, but it does work to prevent you from losing and maintaining your weight loss. And basically the way it works, it's kind of like the thermostat in your home where, you know, your thermostat, it's something called a negative feedback system. So when your thermostat, it it has a certain setting it's trying to maintain, let's say 70 degrees Fahrenheit. When it detects that the temperature deviates, let's say it gets down to 68, then it reacts with a reaction designed to bring the temperature back to the set point. So it kicks on the heat. And that is basically how your hypothalamus works too. So it's constantly monitoring the level of body fatness in your body using a hormone called leptin that's secreted by fat tissue. 
And if your fat tissue starts to shrink, the leptin goes down and your hypothalamus gets wind of it and it starts to kick in a reaction to bring your, your body fatness back up. Just like your thermostat kicks on the heat, your hypothalamus kicks on the hunger, it kicks on the cravings, it may uh, slow your metabolic rate down. Basically, it enacts this whole suite of responses designed to favor the regain of fat. And so I think, you know, this is a major reason, probably I would say one of two major reasons why weight loss is really hard and weight loss maintenance is even harder. Because if it, you know, if, it, if, if we didn't have the system, then you could lose weight and, you know, for, go from obese to lean and it wouldn't be hard to stay lean. It would be just, just as easy to stay lean as it would for a person who started out lean to stay lean. But it's not. It's a lot harder for that person who was formerly obese to maintain a lean state. And in fact, it is rare that, I don't want to say rare, but it's uh, not typical that a person would be able to maintain that amount of a loss. Um, and so, yeah, so basically we have to think about not just how do we eat fewer calories, but how do we get the brain to be comfortable with a, a lower level of body fatness. So uh, there are different strategies we can use, but I think some of the ways that um, have been suggested to help with this are eating more protein. So that seems to help the hypothalamus feel comfortable at a lower level of body fatness. Eating a higher protein diet seems to attenuate some of those uh, reactions that the hypothalamus engages to try to fight weight loss. Um, physical activity, getting more exercise seems to be something that can also help with that. Um, and also eating a simpler, less highly palatable diet. So we're accustomed to this, um, you know, constant entertainment of our palates by food. And this, you know, this gets back to what we were talking about earlier about how it's um, challenging to eat a simpler diet because you know, if you're used to being constantly entertained, it's not so easy to go to being not entertained constantly. Um, and so, um, but it turns out that that uh, palatability, so that's basically a, a, a signal that your brain really likes a food on some basic instinctive level. When it tastes really good, it's like your brain is saying, yeah, this has the stuff that I really like in it. This is good stuff. Um, but what that does is when you eat something really palatable, your brain starts to take the brakes off the systems that prevent you from eating because your brain is thinking, Hey, this is a really valuable food. How are we going to get more of this into the body? And so, as I was talking about earlier, it shuts down your satiety partially. And, uh, one other thing that I believe it does is it, starts to increase your set point. So basically it allows your body to hold more fat in order to allow you to eat more of that food on an ongoing basis. And so uh, eating a simpler diet seems to help lower the comfortable level of um, body fatness that your brain will defend. So basically these are strategies for trying to recruit your non-conscious systems to help support your goals instead of having to continually fight them. Um, the last thing I'll mention is, is stress. So a lot of people, and this is, according to research, this is uh, particularly common among women. A lot of people, when they feel stressed out, they will overeat and they will eat overeat uh, unhealthy food. This happens to women and men, but I think it's more common among women. Um, and so if you can manage your stress level, um, and also manage your sleep, that's another way to, um, impact the system in a, in a more favorable way. 
Absolutely. And going back to the client that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, who's maintained such a significant weight loss, he's practicing a lot of the principles that you mentioned in the hungry brain. So things like changing his food environment, choosing lower palatability foods, like choosing oatmeal instead of an egg McMuffin. He exercises daily, which I think is really important for maintenance and maybe even lowering our set point. And all of his changes have been small, sustainable ones that he can keep doing for the rest of his life. He also practices a lot of the ACT principles that I had mentioned earlier in this episode. So one of the things that we worked a lot on were values and the the why behind making these behavioral commitments that he's made. He also records his food and and has um, practiced self-monitoring for many, many years. And he also has worked a lot on self-compassion. So I think all of that together is gives a good example of how um, using psychology in combination with understanding our biological dispositions can be really helpful for weight management. And at the same time, the field of psychology has been shifting more and more towards a medicalized model, so using medications and surgery for weight loss. And I'm curious whether or not what your thoughts are on this. I know that you've mentioned that medications and surgery are like putting a sledgehammer to a nail, but do you think there's a future for, you know, solely behavioral interventions for weight loss, or do we need to turn to surgery and medication as our solution? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, it it depends on your definition of effective. I mean, I think weight loss, for some of the reasons we've been discussing, weight loss is a very challenging thing. And the average person with obesity is probably not going to succeed in becoming lean. Uh, they probably will succeed in losing some weight, but becoming lean is is really more of a challenge. Uh, through behavioral approaches alone for some of the reasons we discussed. Uh, you know, I don't mean to be discouraging to anyone, but I'm just trying to be truthful about what the evidence says. Um, and, but I mean, you know, we have studies like the diabetes prevention program study. This is a study that was done. I, I think everybody should know about this, this study. It was done in, uh, over 3000 people. It was a randomized controlled trial that lasted, um, 2.8 years to the primary endpoint. What they did was they gave people a diet-based weight loss program and uh, also regular physical activity. And the goal was for them to lose about 7% of their body weight and exercise for, I think, 150 minutes a week. Well, it turns out that they only lost about 4% of their body weight. So they fell far short of the goal only about 58% of them adhered to the exercise intervention. And yet, the intervention reduced diabetes risk by 58% over 2.8 years. So it had a massive impact. Even though it was this really modest intervention, they were using this uh, kind of calorie counting, low-fat diet approach. Probably wasn't, you know, super effective, but um, in terms of weight loss, but, um, it, nevertheless, this very modest change in energy balance in these people caused a huge reduction in disease risk. And this finding has been replicated over and over and over again in people of different ethnicities on different continents, different races. It's rock solid that you can reduce, you can greatly reduce diabetes risk with really small changes in diet and lifestyle. And so I think uh, this gives hope because it suggests that even if you can't lose all of your excess body fatness, you can still dramatically reduce your risk of succumbing to metabolic disease. And so I think that is really encouraging and you can do so with the tools that we currently have available. And those tools, I believe, are improving every day. So you're about to have a baby, it sounds like, next month. And I guess what I'm curious about is, as you're bringing another human into the world, how do you plan to 
uh, feed your baby and, and, you know, relate to food in your family around bringing another, uh, you know, sort of optimizing your baby's health? Yeah. So, uh, it starts prenatally, um, you know, trying to, I, I'm the cook in my house and, uh, trying to make healthy, unrefined, uh, foods, um, eating an omnivorous diet and, uh, continuing that throughout pregnancy. Um, but then, you know, after birth, um, breastfeeding as much as possible and not just breast milk in a bottle, but actual breastfeeding on the breast, because it's not just about the nutritional composition of the milk. It's also about the, uh, physical forces that, are exerted on the child's skull from breastfeeding that help with proper development of the uh, jaws and teeth and sinuses and face. Um, so that'll be part of it. And then I don't really know how it's going to go, you know, when, when he's older, it's, I think it's going to be a struggle and it's going to be a conversation uh, trying to, you know, get, food on the table that satisfies both me and him. Um, I'm not really sure how it's going to go, but my goal is to, you know, have him grow up seeing unrefined, healthy, lower calorie dense foods as the default choice. Um, the default thing to eat. And I think that's important because that reinforcement learning we were talking about before it's most powerful in childhood. So children are picking up preferences and habits that they'll carry with them for the rest of their lives. And so if you're a child who, you know, your tastes were formed on cheese puffs and Pepsi, you're going to have a harder time eating a healthy diet as an adult because that's where you're going to keep gravitating back toward. So I'm hoping that, you know, by... I don't know if he'll like, you know, vegetable. He probably won't like vegetables that much. Maybe he'll eat some, probably like fruit. Most kids like fruit. Um, but, you know, I'll do what I can to try to guide him in a, in a healthier direction. And certainly I'm not going to have all kinds of food laying around the kitchen, um, especially not calorie dense, ha highly palatable items. Um, I think you know, food is going to be mostly restricted to meal times and maybe one snack in the afternoon. That's the French model of feeding, um, of feeding kids. Yeah. So those are some general thoughts I have. Well, you also have a vegetable garden, which uh, I have two young boys and that's been key for us in terms of their interest in vegetables, because if they help us grow it and then they pick it. So if you have a a bed of just carrots and you go down and pick it, they will, they'll want to go down and pick those carrots and eat those carrots. Although my, my son will actually, he is the strange child that will go and pick kale and eat it <laughs> or lemon lettuce and sorrel from the garden, just eat it fresh off the plant. So that also, you know, having a vegetable garden, having your children know where the food came from and playing a role in some of the work behind that, I think is also just gives a different relationship with food and respect for, uh, for the food itself, um, as well, and just appreciation for it when it makes it to the dinner table. Yeah, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I can leverage some of that too. I think kids are really sensitive to having a sense of control. Like, you know, I think Lunchables is a great example of that. You know, uh, Lunchables, it's not that they're delicious for, for somebody who doesn't know what this is. It's like a little tray that has little, uh, cells in it that have l different foods like crackers and cheese and pepperoni and the kid can kind of compose his or her, her own, you know, little sandwiches and things. I think the reason why kids like this is not because Lunchables are delicious. It's because it's, they enjoy having that sense of control over what they're eating and, and yeah, and it looks cool to their peers. So I think, uh, yeah. Hopefully I'll be able to, to use that to my advantage as well. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Guyane. It's been such a pleasure to have you on and such an honor. 
And I really recommend your book to our listeners to learn more about what's happening in your body and your brain in your relationship with food, but also to you do offer a lot of great strategies that are um, concrete and tangible that people can take away and try out at home. And I will put a link to your book on our show notes so that people can click on that and access it. And also just a link to your website as well, because I also believe you have a program that that people an online program as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. It's called the ideal weight program. And it's based on many of the same principles in my book, it, it dovetails with the book. And one other note I just want to make is that there there can be an overlap between people that struggle with obesity and overweight and people that have eating disorders. And so a lot of the conversation and discussion that we talked about today was for people that aren't struggling with an eating disorder in concordance with overweight. And once you start talking about things like changing, you know, the type or amount of food that you're eating, it's really helpful to have a mental health professional um, that can evaluate and, and work with you if you do have an eating disorder in an, um, in addition to being overweight. So I just wanted to put that information in because my background's in immune disorders and want to make sure that people are um, taking, you know, a, an approach that would not exacerbate um, any kind of eating problem that they may have as well. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Guyane. I really appreciate having you on and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Good to be here. Thank you for listening to Psychologist Off the Clock. You can find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you are having a mental health emergency, please dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources on our webpage. Our website is www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's www.offtheclockpsych.com. Www